I dedicate this play to me, a continuous source of guidance and strength and without whose unflinching loyalty, devotion, and faith, this play would never have been written. Additional acknowledgements. Myself, for proofreading, editorial comments, helpful hints, criticisms and suggestions, and an exquisite job of typing. And I, for independent research into men, married women, and other degenerates. That is how Valerie Solanus opened her play, Up Your Ass. That is the title, Up Your Ass, which is the play that led Valerie Solanus to shoot and try and kill Andy Warhol. Hi, I'm Kate Name. This is my channel. I am an independent producer who is currently working on an immersive play about the world of Andy Warhol and the events that led to his attempted assassination called The Factory. The Factory is a crazy immersive show where the audience is invited to a party at Andy Warhol's factory, where you as an audience member can help silkscreen paintings, sit for your own screen test, help film an underground movie, party with the band, potentially become one of Andy Warhol's superstars, and follow the events that led to the attempted assassination of Andy Warhol by Valerie Solanas. It's a wild show. I workshopped this show at $3 Bill in Bushwick in the fall of 2022, and now I am fundraising to produce the full-scale version, which will happen at $3 Bill in the fall of 2025, God willing. So, hi, um, welcome to my channel. I basically have been making these different videos about all the different characters in my show and the influences to, you know, raise awareness about the fact that I'm doing this at all. I am an independent producer. I've been living in New York for a little over 10 years, and I've been producing very small scale stuff this whole time, but this is a big show. This is a show with 12 characters, a live band. It's gonna be in a big venue. It's gonna have a big audience and doing something at this scale as an independent person, crazy. But I'm very passionate about it and I hope that I can make other people passionate about it as well. So if you would like to follow this journey that I'm on of trying to produce this show, please hit subscribe, um, hit me up on my socials. And if you are really interested in this show, if you wanna help bring it to reality, you can donate, the link will be in the subscription. The factory is fiscally sponsored by Fractured Atlas, which is a nonprofit arts organization. So all donations are tax deductible. If you would like to take it to the next level and potentially invest in this show, you can find my email in the description box. I would love to hear from you. And if you would just like to be involved in the show in any way, honestly, you could send me an email. I would love to hear from you. So that's the deal um, with what we're doing here. Now, let's talk about Valerie Solanas. Valerie Solanus was born April 9th, 1936 to Louis and Dorothy Solanus in New Jersey. And by all accounts, Valerie had a pretty typical childhood. She actually describes her childhood as idyllic and picture perfect, which I find interesting because it wasn't really. Uh, in fact, Valerie was regularly by her dad, starting as a very young girl and lasting all the way up until she was a teenager. It was swept under the rug. It was not acknowledged by anyone in the family until she was about 15 years old. And at age 15, Valerie became pregnant. And I actually am not, I did have done quite a bit of research into this and there's no record that I can find of who the father was. So it's possible that it was somebody her own age, potentially a peer, potentially an older man and potentially her father. So I actually don't know, I think that given her childhood history, it, it is a distinct possibility that she did become pregnant by her own father, but we don't know. Anyways, she is sent away to give birth at like a home for unwed mothers as a 15 year old. She gives her son up for adoption and then she returns to high school and she actually graduates high school on time. She's incredibly smart. And so after 
graduating high school and having this baby and then giving the baby up for adoption and being forced to just like forget all that happened, she goes to college. She um, attends the University of Maryland and she majored in psychology. And Valerie at the time, this is 1955, is an open lesbian, which is pretty rare for 1955. Not only is she an open lesbian, she's very funny, she's very gifted, and she hosts a call-in radio show on the campus of the University of Maryland where she advises female students on how to combat men. I wonder why she felt that way. Um, so she, she graduates college and in the summer of 1965, Valerie moves to New York City and she takes her prized typewriter with her. She is kind of homeless throughout this time and sometimes she lives at the Hotel Chelsea, sometimes she lives at the Hotel Earl, um, and sometimes she lives nowhere and she's homeless. And she supports herself primarily through prostitution at this time. But while she's doing that, she is writing all of the time and she writes this article that is called A Young Girl's Primer on How to Attain the Leisure Class, which is very funny and it's all tongue in cheek and it's kind of satire about women's place in the world and how women are able to get ahead. And the article is published in Cavalier Magazine. In the fall of 1965, Valerie decides to start turning that article, A Young Girl's Primer into Attaining the Leisure Class, into a play. And the play, it follows this character, Bonzi, I think their name is, and it's kind of like a self-insert for Valerie, and it follows this character around New York, interacting with men, interacting with women, and uh, it's very, very raunchy, very sexually explicit, and very funny. So anyways, Valerie writes this play, and before she settles on the title Up Your Ass, she considers a number of other titles, including From Cradle to the Boat, the big suck and up from the slime. But eventually she does settle on up your ass. A great title in my opinion. Um, so Valerie submits up your ass to avant-garde, which is a highbrow erotica magazine, which is a really funny phrase to me actually. <laughs> highbrow erotica magazine. Um, avant-garde is so shocked by the play that they refuse to even send it back to her because they don't want to subject it to the US post office. Like they're afraid that the US post office will inspect the play and somehow they will get in trouble. So they insist that she comes to their offices in person if she wants her play back, which she does. So she goes and gets her play. Around this time, this is uh, fall of 1966, by this time, Andy Warhol's factory is fully underway. There are superstars, there are famous people coming, the, Soup can paintings have already been made, the Marilyn Monroe paintings have already been made. Andy Warhol himself is becoming quite a star and he is also making other people stars. And that is the main drop for anybody at this point hearing about the factory because word had spread all over New York that if you go show up at this guy's factory and it truly was a former hat factory in Midtown Manhattan covered in tin foil by meth heads that if you show up to this factory, Andy Warhol might put you in a movie and you might become famous for real. It was like proto Instagram or proto social media, the original influencers becoming famous for being famous. That was what was happening. So Valerie, smart lady that she is, she realizes that if Andy Warhol, the star maker, produces her show, she's gonna hit the big time and this will be it for her. She will become famous. So Valerie sends her play, Up Your Ass, to Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol actually liked the title. Andy Warhol likes controversial things and that title was right up his alley. So he takes the play and he reads it, but he is also so shocked by the play that he thinks that Valerie Solanas is a cop trying to entrap him and he refuses to produce the play. But he doesn't tell her that outright. He kind of strings Valerie along and is like, yeah, Valerie, I'll produce your play. Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Never really intending to do it, but not outright telling her no. And so at the same time, Valerie, who is living at the Hotel Chelsea, starts to become ever more paranoid and she 
starts to develop increasingly radical beliefs. And a lot of these beliefs center around feminism and women's place in the world and her anger at men and her anger at the way that she has been treated throughout her whole life by men. And she decides to form an organization that she calls SCUM, which stands for the Society for Cutting Up Men. And she starts to write her manifesto. She throws herself into writing her manifesto for SCUM. So, and SCUM, by the way, just a side note about SCUM. I recommend reading it. It's, again, she's very smart. She's very intelligent. She's very funny. And I think what will be surprising to a lot of people who haven't read it is that, at least for me when I was reading it, I was like, man, Valerie, I agree with you. <laughs> I agree. She's so ahead of her time. She calls out patriarchal society, essentially. And I'm like, it's so interesting reading it for me because I'm like, yeah, 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 up until the point where she's like, and in conclusion, we kill all the men. And then I was like, oh no, <laughs> oh no, 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 we can't do that. But I was really on board with what you were saying before. <laughs> so I think it's, it's a very short read. It's, it's a manifesto, so it's not like a chapter book exactly. It's just the ramblings of this person, um, but I do, if you're interested, I do recommend reading it. I think it's quite interesting. So once Valerie completes the SCUM manifesto, she gets right to work trying to recruit members for SCUM. She, in April 21st, 1967, Valerie places an ad in the Village Voice trying to recruit members for the Society for Cutting Up Men. At the same time, summer 1967, Valerie starts calling the factory repeatedly, demanding her script for Up Your Ass, which Andy Warhol still has. And Andy Warhol has lost the script. He doesn't know where it is. And Valerie doesn't believe him. Valerie, because she also is becoming more and more paranoid, thinks that Andy Warhol has stolen the script on purpose and that she is he is going to steal her work. So this only fuels her paranoia and her commitment to scum. On August 1st, 1967, Valerie mails Andy Warhol a recruitment poster for scum, and she wants him to hang it in the women's bathroom at the factory. She writes in her letter, maybe you would know some girls who would like to join. Maybe you would like to join the men's auxiliary unit. Um, which in SCUM, she has this whole section about the men's auxiliary unit, which is basically men that are going to join SCUM and then kill themselves, basically. Um, she also writes that Warhol might want to film some SCUM rallies, warning that SCUM is about to kick into high gear. I do want to stress that although Valerie is genuinely trying to recruit women to join SCUM and placing ads in the Village Voice, no one ever joined SCUM. Valerie is and always will be the sole member of the Society for Cutting Up Men, but that does not deter her. So later that summer, Valerie mails Warhol a second poster to hang in the ladies' bathroom at the factory. And then in late August, Valerie mails Warhol a third scum poster to quote, keep under his pillow at night. So she is definitely ramping up the violent rhetoric and kind of, you know, the intensity. Then in late August of 1967, at the Hotel Chelsea, Valerie meets this guy named Maurice, I'm gonna butcher this name, I'm gonna try not to, Maurice Giri, Giro Diaz, Giro Diaz, I apologize, Maurice, I know that is not how you pronounce that name. Um, but he is uh, the founder of Olympia Press, which is a press house. And uh, Maurice, reads the scum manifesto and he thinks that it's genius. He thinks that Valerie has written a satire and that it's a literary joke and he thinks it's very funny and very smart. And he offers Valerie a contract of $1,500 so that he can publish the scum manifesto. And Valerie signs the contract, but then she quickly becomes paranoid that Maurice and Andy Warhol are in cahoots and they are conspiring together to steal her work. So in June 3rd, 1968. This is now the next summer. Her paranoia has been building and building and building and she is determined to put an end to her suffering and put an end to her paranoia. So Valerie packs a paper bag with her address book, a Kotex pad, 
and two handguns. And she actually first visits Maurice's office. Luckily for Maurice, he was not there. But undeterred, Valerie then goes to the factory and she ha actually meets Andy Warhol on the street on his way up into the factory. So they walk into the building together. They ride the elevator together. They're chatting. They enter the factory. And in fact, Andy Warhol compliments Valerie in front of Paul, another factory member who we will learn more about in the coming week. Um, Andy compliments Valerie in front of Paul and says that she's looking really good. Um, she's wearing makeup, which she doesn't typically do. And Paul agrees. Like, they're both like, yeah, Valerie, you're looking great. But they're like, we actually need to get to work. And so they tell her kindly that they're going to get to work and that she needs to go. And that's when Valerie pulls out a gun and she shoots Andy Warhol three times, hitting him in the stomach. She also shoots some other people in the factory. Paul tells her to go. And for some reason, Valerie listens to Paul and she runs out of the factory and Warhol is rushed immediately to the hospital. Andy Warhol barely survives the night. In fact, he actually, I have heard, died on the table and it wasn't until other factory people that had come to the hospital were there. They were like, they saw that he was dying and they told the doctors, you don't understand. This man is very famous. You have to work harder. And the doctors were like, oh, he's famous? Okay, I guess we'll try harder. And they, they saved him, which is crazy to me. <laughs> um, but, but he survives the night. So at the same time that Andy Warhol is fighting for his life at the hospital, Valerie walks on over to the East 21st Street East 21st Street precinct and turns herself into the police. She does not even try to hide. So she is booked and in front of the cameras, when this is all being reported, she smiles for the cameras and she plugs the scum manifesto. She says that it's not often that I shoot somebody. I didn't do it for nothing. Which, you know, I have to respect. <laughs> <laughs> on June 5th, 1968, the Village Voice reports on this shooting and they describe Valerie as an actress, not a writer, a man-hater, not a lesbian, and is quoted as calling herself a flower child. Valerie rages from jail. She is incensed that she has been described this way. She's particularly upset over allegedly calling herself a flower child. And she says, quote, I would never say such a sick thing. Then the next day on June 6th, 1968, Senator Robert F. Kennedy is assassinated and actually does die. And all of the news media immediately goes from the Warhol Valerie story to the assassination of Robert Kennedy. And this whole event was kind of forgotten, especially because Andy Warhol survived, he didn't die. And Valerie stays in jail and Andy Warhol eventually gets out and starts to move on with his life. What's really interesting about this, and I am going to get into this in upcoming videos, but after the shooting, Andy Warhol becomes very scared of cisgendered women and he pretty much stops working with women at all. And it's after the shooting that Andy Warhol really starts working with drag queens pretty much exclusively as his superstars, at least for a little while. And immediately after the shooting, the next film that he does is a film called Women in Revolt, which stars the drag queens Candy Darling, Jackie Curtis, and Holly Woodlawn. And they star as this trio of feminists in um, an organization called PIGS, which stands for Politically Involved Girls. And you can guess where he got that inspiration from. And I will again be discussing that film in an upcoming video. But for now, I'm going to leave it there. That is essentially the story of Valerie Solanas and Andy Warhol. Valerie Solanas eventually does get out of prison and she moves to San Francisco. She is uh, an, she pretty much stays homeless more or less for the rest of her life. Her family does not accept her. And she ends up dying at a welfare, welfare hotel in San Francisco. Um, her body is discovered by an employee at the hotel that she works at in April 25th, 1988. Uh, Valerie is found kneeling on the floor, her body crawling with maggots, 
with a stack of papers at her side, papers that she has typewritten herself. And uh, her room appears otherwise orderly. And she was only 52 when she passed away. Interesting enough, actually, Andy Warhol and Valerie Solanas both died in 1988. And they only died a few months after each other and they were both in their 50s. So they were both were fairly young. And in fact, Andy Warhol died kind of of complications from this shooting. It actually was a gallbladder issue that he passed away from, but he had such fear of hospitals after the whole shooting situation that he really resisted going to the hospital when he was sick with his gallbladder issues. And that contributed to the reason that he passed away. So kind of an interesting thing to end on. I kind of also wanted to end on a personal story uh, back in like 2015. So before I had started working on this show, when I just was a person that was obsessed with Andy Warhol, I dressed as Andy Warhol for Halloween, and I was living in Washington Heights in New York at the time, and I went to this very small bar that my friend was bartending at in Washington Heights, tiny, tiny little bar, and I was dressed as Andy Warhol, and I'm there, we're partying, and this woman comes up to me, and she says, are you Andy Warhol? And I said, yes. And she was like, my cousin was Valerie Solanas. And it was shocking. I didn't, I really didn't know what to say to her, especially because I was dressed as Andy Warhol. And I was like, is that insensitive? Like, I just didn't know. I really didn't know how to respond to her telling me that she was related to Valerie. And um, she told me that her family pretty much disowned Valerie after the shooting and they burned a lot of her possessions, her writing, and it was sad. It was it was interesting that she, you know, her family disowned Valerie, but she still felt enough of a connection to Valerie to approach me when I was dressed as Andy Warhol and talk to me about it. So it was a really interesting conversation, and this is totally going to out me as a millennial, but at the same bar, when I was talking to Valerie Solanas's cousin, the dude you're getting a Dell guy was there. If, I don't know if you recall those commercials. It was that like stoner type guy that would be like, dude, you're getting a Dell. Dude, you're getting a Dell. Easy to buy, easy to He was also there <laughs> at this bar on Halloween in like 2015. It felt like a fever dream. It was so weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Valerie's cousin, if you're watching this, thank you for, for approaching me. I thought that was really interesting and it's something I still think about fairly regularly. Um, so yeah, I'm going to end the video here. Thank you for watching. Please again, subscribe to the channel. If you like this content, if you want to learn more about me or the factory, you can follow my Instagram account, um, reach out via email if you want to be involved in the show. And of course, if you are interested in helping support this project, which I would love, you can donate to the factory. The link is in the bio and I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much for watching. And the next week, we are talking about Billy Name, I believe, which is my namesake as Kate Name. So that's going to be a fun video. I love Billy Name. Um, so tune in next week and we will continue this little storytelling adventure that we are on. Thank you for watching. I will see you next time. Bye.